I am so thrilled to be here with everybody today. Give yourself a round of applause, please, really do that. I have met, I, 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 they tried to keep me in Washington yesterday. I was stuck on the tarmac. Mustafa was stuck too. We were texting back and forth with other different planes. And, and, and then we uh, couldn't get out last night. It came in this afternoon. And I had a chance to take a lot of selfies and talk to a lot of folks. And I appreciate the warmth with which I was greeted. But more than that, I appreciate looking in your eyes and you all telling me what pa you're passionate about. I met folk who were passionate about uh, justice for animals. I met people who were passionate about Washington, D.C. having more people in it than two states, but not having states' rights. I met people who know about the injustice of the criminal justice reform. I met activists who are using technology in innovative ways. The more I shook hands, the more selfies I took, the more I felt my soul and my spirit nourished. I am so grateful for those folks who for 12 years now have been making net roots such a powerful coalition of progressive people. And now I want to tell you, when I started out, when I was just a 20-something in the streets of Newark, New Jersey, uh, we didn't have net roots. <laughs> the internet was still, you know, just taking hold. But I feel like when I was shaking hands with folks here and taking some pictures, I, I really have to say I, I felt the same energy I felt when I was organizing in the grassroots of Newark. I live in the central ward of an incredible city with this next generation of leaders in that city, Raz Baraka, Maria Teresa Ruiz, some incredible young leaders coming up and leading our city. And I tell you, I am proud to live in Newark. But of all the neighborhoods we have in Newark, I am proud that I live in the neighborhood I live in. I'm the only United States senator that lives in a community that is rich with culture, has a wealth of spirit, has incredible, incredible people. But I'm the only United States senator that lives in a community that the median income is according to the last census, $14,000 per household. I, I live in a community that is technically below the federal poverty line. And my neighbors, I tell you, they're hardworking folks, people working full-time jobs, people struggling to make their American dream. And I'm reminded why I got into politics in the first place. If you came into my office in the Senate, it's the map of that first district that when I was 28 years old, just starting to challenge the political machine, it's folk in this community that believed in me and that have taught me some of the greatest lessons of spirit. We are all here trying to live out what Martin Luther King in a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama, when he wrote that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a common network, tied in a common network of destiny. We're trying to make real that spirit by creating those connections. And what I want to do briefly that I'm time with you here is I want to talk about three of the folks who taught me at a, at a critical point in my life. I always say I got my BA from Stanford, but my PhD on the streets of Newark. And these are folks like some of the folks I shook hands with earlier, people that took me under their wing and taught me about what it means to be a leader, what it means to be part of a network, what power is all about. And their names are Carl Sharif, their names are Virginia Jones and Hassan Washington. The first person I want to talk to you about is Carl Sharif, and he was this incredible 60s activist, changed his name from Carl Dawson to Carl Sharif, joined the Islamic community, and became this incredible leader, helped many people in my city get elected, and he met me at a time that tenant activists were pushing me to get into politics, and I was thinking about shifting from being a grassroots tenants' rights organizer to actually running to be the youngest person ever elected in my city's history at the municipal level to running to be a central ward councilman. And he met me, here was this guy that though I've lived half my life in Newark, at that point I had just showed up from Yale Law School and he sat with me for a while and talked to me almost as if he was checking me out. This man with such authentic spirit, such an authentic connection to the community, and this is the advice he told me. He said, Corey, you need to go out. You're not gonna win this election unless you go out and knock on every single door in the district and have a conversation with every single person. You see, you no know, man, you're coming with a lot, of, a lot of spirit, a lot of energy, but this city doesn't need a savior. 
This city needs someone who is going to connect with community and someone who's going to be an ally, someone who's going to be a partner, someone who is going to connect to folks because that's where power comes from. There are a lot of folk who have stopped even participating in municipal elections because they don't believe that their vote matters. You've got to show up and talk to folks where they are. You have got to humble yourself at their altar of understanding and experience. I think a lot about the Democratic Party nationally and how it seems that that connection to people, where they are, what their experiences are, their struggles, their hurts and their pain, how we seem to have lost our way. And on how what you all are doing in this room, what we need to be doing is reconnecting ourselves to folk where they are. I'll tell you this. The Democratic Party is good for nothing if it is not standing up for the values and the issues. My grandfather in Detroit, Michigan, was, was a Republican at a time that blacks, most blacks in the country were Republicans. And when FDR came on and started talking about things that made a difference to people, Social Security, Medicare, started making changes. My grandfather went out and organized 14 districts to switch over from Democrat to, from Republican to Democrat because people believed that this party was going to stand for the working person. Well, Carl Sharif sent me out there to connect with folks, and I know that part of his dream for me, sort of his hope for me on sending me out to knock on thousands and thousands of doors was he seemed to understand the truth that you can't lead the people if you don't love the people. And I'm telling you, everybody wants to talk about patriotism, but we forget patriotism is love of country, and you cannot love your country unless you love your fellow country men and women. I, I can't believe how our nation is making tolerance the, 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 the pinnacle, tolerance, what we're reaching for. You go home and tell somebody that you care about, yeah, I tolerate you, I tolerate you. As if that is something that this nation should aspire to. Carl Sharif seemed to understand is that we should be aspiring for love and fundamental to love is knowledge, is empathy, is compassion, is knowing another struggle. And when you go out and you knock on folks' doors, when you humble yourself before the altar of their experience, of their struggle, of their perspective, it deepens your sense of connection, it deepens your sense of love. And if you love someone, you see their worth, you see their dignity, you see their value, you know that your destiny is interwoven with them. Carl Sharif sent me out on an odyssey of love. And I'm telling you right now, we as a nation need to rekindle that. There's too much hate in our nation. And it's not just the kind that you see that's bigotry and sexism and racism, but it's the kind that divides us from one another and undermines the calling of our country, e pluribus unum. The reality is that we as a nation, it's like that African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. We have got to be a nation that can unite folks I don't want to vilify any individuals because of their political beliefs when the real threat, the real challenge is that so many people are inactive now. So many people are sitting on the sidelines. So many people think democracy is a spectator sport. We have got to restore the human connections that are necessary to cultivate not just love, but engagement, a more courageous empathy, a more powerful activism. And that brings me to the next person, Miss Virginia Jones. You see, she was somebody that really knew that if we stop and listen to each other and see each other and feel each other and love each other, we would know from inner cities to rural areas, from suburban places uh, to factory towns, that there is a common pain in this country. But we are lacking a sense of common purpose a common pain, but we're lacking a sense of common purpose. She had this frustration that somehow this nation along the way had surrendered its vision for itself and that there was more of an existential angst that came from people not seeing the true calling of this country. You see, Miss Jones was this woman who was about five feet and a smidgen tall, 
Like Carl, she was one of my elders in the community, and she was tough. I do not sanction any kind of violence, but one of the stories about her that was legend in the neighborhood is the slumlord and the high-rise projects, projects I would move into and live into in for about a decade, tough buildings with a horrible slumlord. Legend was that she, she punched this slumlord in the face, <laughs> just popped him. The, the landlord sued, dragged her, to, dragged her to court. The judge, the story is the judge sat there and looked at her, this small, demure woman, and you know she played that up. She was clutching her purse, I'm sure. <laughs> and looked at this big slumlord and just threw the case out of court. She had her son murdered in the lobby of the building I would move into. So much hurt, so much pain in our communities were disconnected from the suffering. But she was this woman that never left. I asked her, why, why haven't you left these buildings, she and I were two of the highest net worth earners that, that, that were in those buildings. I said, I knew she could live other places. I said, why, why are you still here? And she looks at me and she goes, boy, why am I still here? I go, yes, ma'am. She goes, why am I still in apartment 4A? She goes, I, I go, yes, ma'am. She goes, why am I still the tenant president since these buildings were built in 1969? That's electoral longevity, folks. Uh, you know, <laughs> we had no term limits in Newark. And I go, yes, Ms. Jones, why? And she goes, because I am in charge of Homeland Security. She had this sense of responsibility. She, she lived those 10 two-letter words that are necessary for change. It's essential for being a change agent. Those 10 two-letter words, if it is to be, it is up to me. She didn't allow her inability to do everything, to undermine her determination to do something. She didn't get all upset, caught up in a state of sedentary agitation. She every day got up even on the painful days, even on the hurtful days, she taught you by watching her that sometimes courage doesn't yell and scream or give a big speech or a battle cry, that courage is most often marked in America by those folks after a day of pain, of shame, of hurt, that no one can imagine, it seems, that you still get up the next morning, get dressed and go outside for another day of working and serving and loving. What Ms. Jones taught me it's this idea that somehow we have a crisis of vision. When I had first come to that neighborhood and I, and I was still this Yale Law student, I showed up as if, you know, that, that swagger, and I knocked on her door and I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm Corey Booker, uh, I'm from <clears throat> Yale Law School, ma'am, I'm here to help. And she looks at me like the eyes saying, boy, you're the one that needs some help. And this was a tough neighborhood, and after talking for a while, she took me to Martin Luther King Boulevard, and she said, what do you see around you? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, describe the neighborhood, and I described it, the high-rise projects, the graffiti, the abandoned building being used for drug, a drug house, and I just started describing the neighborhood, the one I still live in now. And she looks at me, and she starts looking upset. And finally, she says, you can't help me, and she starts walking away, and I run after this woman, I grab her from behind, very respectfully, and I... <laughs> And I say, ma'am, what are you talking about? And she goes, boy, you need to understand something. The world you see outside of you is a reflection of what you have inside of you. And if all you see is problems, darkness, and despair, that's all there's ever going to be. But if you're one of those stubborn people who every time you open your eyes, you see hope, you see opportunity, you see beauty, you see love, you see the face of God, then you can be one of those people who helps me. And she walks away, leaving me there on the streets, thinking to myself, OK, grasshopper, thus ended the lesson. What's happening to our vision in this country? She wasn't the first leader that talks about what you see outside of you. She wasn't the first leader to talk about something's wrong in this country. Martin Luther King spoke in one of his famous speeches. It was after John Lewis and marchers had tried to march from Selma to Montgomery and they got stopped on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, gassed and beaten by Alabama state troopers, they came back and marched again and eventually they made it. And King gave his famous speech. Some of you all know one of the lines where he says, how long, not long, because the truth crushed to the earth will rise again. How long, not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Many of you all know those lines, but I think a more important line to this speech is what the what Martin Luther King talked about by challenging the vision of this country and what we are beginning to accept as normal. 
Let me read you what King said. On March 25th, 1965, he said, it's normalcy all over the country, which leaves the Negro perishing on an island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. It's normalcy all over America that prevents the Negro from becoming a registered voter. It is normalcy. And no, we will not allow Alabama to return to normalcy. In honor of these two elders that I talked to you about of going through my community and seeing the realities and connecting to the people and the struggles in reality for a woman who never stopped seeing what America could be and should be, I want to tell you right now that we know in this room the kind of normalcy that Martin Luther King was talking about. It's a normalcy we've allowed to creep into this country that a person working a full-time job in this nation at minimum wage still lives in poverty. It's a normalcy that's crept into this country where in every county, there is not one county in America where a person making minimum wage can afford a two-family home. It's a normalcy that's crept into this generation of America so different than generations past where every generation economically would do better than the next generation. 90% of baby boomers did better economically than their parents, but now it's normal. In the millennials, it's just a coin toss. Only 50% will do better. It's a normalcy in this country that all over this nation, hundreds of thousands of Americans can barely afford their prescription drugs or cut pills in half just so that they can afford them. It's normalcy in this nation to have a criminal justice system where Brian Stevenson says, we have a nation that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than poor and innocent. It's normal in this country that we've created poverty being a crime in this nation where right now as we sit comfortably here, some of you all know the name, Kalir Kalir Browder. There are thousands of kids in our country right now as we sit here who've been convicted of nothing but sit in jails because they cannot afford the bail to get out. It's normalcy in America that people in our country for doing things that three of the last four presidents admitted to doing have a life sentence, not a life sentence in jail, but you know a nonviolent drug offense in this country means that for the rest of your life, you can't get a Pell Grant. It means you can't get food stamps, you can't get many jobs, you can't get many business licenses. It's normal in this country that every month, thousands of people are victims of gunshots. That yes, we seem to notice, although it's becoming more and more normal, mass shootings, but in neighborhoods like mine, all across America, people are being shot day after day after day after day. Shahad Smith murdered at the top of the block that I live on right now. It's normal in America. Yes, we, we seem to say it was abnormal for people to be separated, families to be separated, children taken away from families at the border. We seem to say that that was a normal, abnormal as a country, but here we are in a nation that all across our country, our immigration laws are having people s- separated from their families, being threatened with deportation people with children that are American citizens, grandchildren, American citizens, spouses that are American citizens being separated. It's normal in America that teachers are most valuable, most productively contributing profession in our country that public school teachers are paid so little that many of them have no financial security. It's become normal in our nation, as Mustafa said, as we travel for the South to see people who will stand up in crowded churches and talk about how it's normal in their community, normal in their family to have lead poisoning, to have asthma, to have cancer, diseases that are being caused by the worst type of corporate villainy, where they're outsourcing their pollutions on communities and their costs and their internalizing profits. This is becoming too normal in America. And it's why We all must reject the normalcy of injustice. It's why in the Senate I fight so hard every single day. I reject the normalcy that Martin Luther King called a form of brutality, which is unemployment, why I was the first senator to introduce a federal jobs guarantee model legislation. 
I reject the normalcy that says we have more marijuana arrests as we had in 2016 than violent crime arrests. That's why I introduced the Marijuana Justice Act that not just legalizes marijuana on the federal level. Don't talk about legalization unless you're talking about expunging the records of people that have been tried. I reject the normalcy of our nation, that we have such savage divides and access to health care. I reject that normalcy by saying that health care is a right in this country, and we should have Medicare for all. I reject the new normalcy in this country that seems to be, has been accepted by too many after Citizens United of corporate dollars, an obscene amount of corporate dollars. That's why I'm one of only five senators, now six, that says we reject corporate contributions. We will not take them. You will not influence it. That's 96, that's 94 senators to go. I reject the normalcy that corporations that pollute get more legal power than the citizens that they're polluting. And that's why I introduced the environmental justice bill with partners like Mustafa. I reject that normalcy. I reject the normalcy that teachers, public school teachers are undervalued, underpaid, underappreciated, and often financially underwater. And that's why I've called for a GI bill for public school teachers so that they get the tax breaks that now are given to hedge fund operators, that they get the tax breaks that they deserve and the incentives to come and teach in communities. And I reject the normalcy in our country that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans in the majority of states, they may now be able to marry and put it online, their celebration of their love, but in the majority of states, they could be fired from their job with no legal recourse. That is the normal that I reject, and that's why I support and have sponsored the Equality Act that would end that in America. We in this country have to start saying we reject the normalcy of injustice. We were a nation that founded itself by saying we would be an abnormal nation in the most righteous of ways. We broke with theocracies and monarchies and totalitarian forms of government, and we formed a nation founded in liberty. And I'm not going to say in any way it was perfect. Our founders who wrote into our documents that Native Americans were savages, that blacks were fractions of human beings, women not mentioned at all, but we put forth into this universe the oldest constitutional democracy that we would be a nation always striving to set a higher and a better normal. We would put forth the American dream. And we said we would sacrifice for it. We say an oath that we are a nation of liberty and justice for all, but that's just words. It's a civic faith, but I'm one of these people that says, before you tell me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. Well, how are we living our civic gospel? How are we living our civic gospel that demands for us to reject the normalcy of injustice, the normalcy of apathy, the normalcy of indifference, and rise to the higher ground of activism, of engagement, of love. And that's the last person I want to end with. His name is Hassan Washington. I'm a big believer that if America, if this country hasn't broken your heart, then you don't love her enough. Because there's things that are savagely wrong in this country. There's a normalcy of injustice that we've accepted. And I tell you, Newark has gifted me a wisdom that can only come from wounds, a sense of purpose that can only come from shared pain. It's a city that at times where my heart has been broken, but I've learned that the heart is this interesting organ that can, it's the only one that really works even if it's gotten broken. And that's why I say Hassan Washington. I tell you this story with a, a burden of shame of making mistakes. You see, Hassan and his crew, young group of boys, I watched them grow up over the almost decade I lived in these high-rise projects. Those projects sit at the top of the hill where I now live, and Hassan and his kids, 
His friends, I tell you, they were amazing. They used to hang out in the lobby of my building. Hassan, I took a love, liking to him because he reminded me just of my dad. Both of them born poor, yeah, sure, but both of them had a wit and a wisdom and a wealth of spirit and humor. Both of them were raised by their grandparents. He lived just a few floors below me in the tower that I lived in. And Hassan and his friends would greet me when I came home. They would cheer me on. But one day I came home and I smelled something in the lobby of that building that I had not smelled so pungently since I was at Stanford. <laughs> but you all know we have different justice systems in this country. I mean, we've had sort of de facto marijuana legalization because there's many communities people aren't afraid. They have no worries about it. In fact, there's no difference in America between blacks and whites for using marijuana or smoking marijuana, but if you're black, you're almost four times more likely to be arrested for it if you're black and poor or poor, period. Well, you know. And so I knew immediately I'm smelling pot in these spaces. These kids don't have margins afforded me and my friends when I grew up in a different part of New Jersey. And so I, I quickly started organizing them, taking them out to, 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 to dinner. I asked them, let's go to a movie, fellas, so we can talk. You picked the movie, which was a mistake. <laughs> I thought it was a home improvement movie. movie. It was called Saw. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I embarrassingly tell you, I got busy and didn't follow through on a lot of the things I had intended to do with these boys. And I got busy running for office. I was running for mayor of the city of Newark. And, and, and yet, even though I got busy and wasn't following through, they were still in that lobby when I'd come home at night. They were still cheering me on, yelling at me, hey, we're going to vote for you. We got you. And I would smile to myself knowing that they were 17 and couldn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I got elected. I won my dream. I became the mayor of New Jersey's largest city. And, Immediately, the FBI warned us that I had death threats, so they surrounded me with security, stationed police officers in the projects. People always joked me it was the safest we had ever been in those projects. But the kids in that lobby, I don't care who you are in this room, you don't want to hang out in high school where there's police station. And so I didn't see these boys, but I was running around the city in my first month in office, when there were shootings, I would run to the scenes of shootings and give street-level sermons telling folks, this is not who we are, this is my plans, I need your help. We would partner together, and one day I got, about a month into my term in office, I get to the, to, the, to, the, to the street on Court Street in Newark, and there's a shooting, and one body seems to be loaded into an ambulance, another one covered, and I, I, barely, I barely acknowledged the humanity on that sidewalk. I was too busy talking to the people. There was a senior citizen building right there. People were gathering around, and I was talking to them. By the end of the day, late at night, I'm going home to steal some hours of sleep, and I'm sitting down on my bed reading my Blackberry, the reports, and then I see it, the name of the person who was murdered on that street. It was Hassan Washington. God had put him right in front of me, four floors below me. He, he reminded me of my dad, my dad who, when his grandmama couldn't take care of him, strangers brought him in. My dad, when people pooled their money to get him off to college, my dad whose story is not just a story of hard work and grit, but of loving communities that would not let this child fall behind. And there he was, Hassan Washington, at my doorstep every day, and I let him slip. His funeral, I will never forget. Perry's funeral home in the central ward of Newark. It was this one room in the basement that you go down into it, and it's like walking into the bow of a ship. And there we were, packed into that room, chained together in grief, swaying with, with each other, moaning in our pain and our agony, piled in one on top of the other. And there I was, standing in the back, hurting feeling shame and pain about Hassan's loss. And I look up there and I see something that is now normal in America. Another black boy in a box. And here we all were. So many of us crowded together for his death. But where were we for his life? I stand here with you today to tell you I am proud
proud of net roots. I am proud of the activists I've met. I'm proud of the handshakes and the hugs. I feel the spirit in this room. But we are at a time where injustice has grown to be normal in our country, and it's time for us to work together to get folk woke, to help people understand their power, to let folks know that what I'm talking about, some people might say, oh, those are impossible challenges, but they've got to know that American history is a perpetual screaming testimony to the achievement of the impossible. We gotta let folks know that no matter how powerful corporate greed and corporations might be getting, no how powerful the obstruction in Washington is, how powerful an office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue may seem, we have to let people know that in the history of this country we have shown time and time again that the power of the people is greater than the people in power. And now, and now, my fellow Americans, it's time for us to awaken the dream of this country again, to renew the dream, to make the dream anew. It's time for us to let people know that what we're seeing in this country doesn't reflect our spirit. What we're seeing in this country doesn't reflect, reflect our potential. What we're seeing in this country is not as mighty as the love that we have together. And I promise you, if we have that kind of conviction that we will make the promise of our nation real, that will make the dreams of our country real, then we will achieve this nation. And so I end with a challenge to everyone here. It's a challenge that was written into a poem that was published the year my dad was born. In 1936, this poet, seeing this country where people were accepting such injustice as normal, where we needed a call to the conscience of our country, he said to this country to swear a new oath, that this nation would be who we say we are, and that nothing was going to happen inevitably, that we had to fight for it and work for it and sweat for it. And he asked people to swear an oath, not with your hands over your heart, but your hand outreached to your neighbor, one to another to another, a network of Americans struggling together, sacrificing together, sweating together, working together. He knew that that was the secret to our country, being a nation of liberty and justice for all. And so he wrote these words, calling on people to swear that oath, and this is what he said. He said, oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, but yet must be the land where everyone is free. The poor man, the Indian, the Negro, me. And who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must make our mighty dream live again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Ladies and gentlemen, let us swear that oath today. Let us be determined, let us be unyielding, let us be indefatigable that this country will live up to its promise, not just to the fortunate few, but to the all, to the mighty, to the people. Let us swear this oath that where there is injustice, we will rectify it. Where there is pain, we will heal it. Where there is hurt, we will help it. That we will be the modern day agents of this democracy to demand, to struggle, to fight, to make it real. And if we do these things, then the words of a man called King will come true, reflecting the words of a great prophet. We can make a nation where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Oh, we can do better than that. How's everybody doing? You know, it's amazing. So I went back home recently uh, to Appalachia to visit my mother. And I had to pick up a couple of things for her. And as I was walking toward the store, I was taking a couple of steps, and I heard a voice in the background that said, Junebug, is that you? And I was thinking, my mother didn't name me Junebug. So I took a couple other steps, and I heard, Junior, do you hear me calling you? 
And I said, well, that's getting closer to my name, but my name is not Junior. So I took a couple more steps, and I heard someone say, boy, I know you hear me talking to you. So I turn around, and it's my elementary school teacher. And she says, Mustafa, how are you? And I said, I'm blessed. And she said, highly favored. I said, yes, ma'am. And then she said, I see you sometimes on TV. She said, what's really going on? Do you remember what I taught you? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, let me hear it. I said, we find these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, endowed with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. She said, that last part is getting a little hard, isn't it? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. She said, well, what are you doing about it? I said, well, at the Hip Hop Caucus and with a whole bunch of other folks, we booted Pruitt. I said, we are wheeling out Wheeler. She said, well, what are you doing with Zinke? I said, well, I don't know. We're getting slinky with Zinke. I didn't know what to say. I was running out of words. She said, well, maybe what you need to do is you need to call up Olivia Pope. I said, OK. She said, you got her phone number, don't you? I was like, mm, no. But you know, you can't tell your elders everything like that. She said, because you need gladiators for change. Y'all say gladiators for change. Say it one more time like you mean it. Gladiators for change. So she said, you know Mrs. Jenkins down here at the end of the block who has the beauty shop? She said, she's a gladiator for change. She said that Ms. Jenkins had a problem where the coal trucks were coming and idling beside her shop, and the emissions were coming in. So Mrs. Jenkins understood the power of her vote. And she would take and get a number of the ladies who came into her shop to agree that they would vote. So she took that list down to the town hall and said, I need your help. And if you don't give me the help, then we'll find somebody else who can. Y'all say, go ahead, Ms. Jenkins. Go ahead, Ms. Jenkins. Say, go ahead, Ms. Jenkins. Go ahead, Ms. Jenkins. So as I was walking away, I heard her say, remember James Baldwin, when he said that if you love me, then you have to raise your consciousness and address the things that people don't see. So I started to think about the power of our vote. I was thinking about environmental climate issues, healthcare related issues, gun reform, and how it all comes together. So you guys do me a favor, everybody take a deep breath in. Let it out. You know the power of your vote can change that dynamic because in our country 200,000 people die prematurely every year from air pollution. You have the ability to make change happen if you utilize your vote. Places like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, when you go there and you roll down the windows of your car, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. But we have gladiators for change in Juan Parras and Brian, and Brian Parras with Tejas who are helping to make real change happen. But they need your help with your vote. If you slide down the coast a little bit further and you go to Port Arthur, Texas, you have a gentleman by the name of Hilton Kelly who stands tall as a gladiator for change fighting against the petrochemical corporations that are there. And each day, people's eyes are burning, their throats are burning. They're facing all kinds of public health challenges. But it's our vote that helps them on the state level and the federal level to make real change happen. But we've got to get engaged. By a show of hands, how many folks in the room know somebody who has asthma? Raise your hand if you know somebody. Everybody look around the room right now. It's amazing that there's not one hand that hasn't gone up. 27 million people in our country are suffering from asthma, seven million children. And disproportionately, it is African-American and Latino children who are going to the emergency room and who unfortunately are losing their lives. Our vote can change that. We can put people in who care about what's happening inside of our communities. We have gladiators in Flint with Little Miss Flint and Pastor Hawkins. And we know the impacts that lead is happening, but sometimes we forget that over one million children in our communities have been exposed to lead poisoning. We have to do something that over 3,000 locations across our country have higher levels of lead. So we have to use our vote to make real change actually happen. Sometimes each and every one of us forget that we have power. 
I'm going to prove to you that you have power. Everybody stand up, if you can. I know some of y'all was out late last night on Bourbon Street. <laughs> How many people in the room remember the Women's March? So there were a whole bunch of men who said a, mil a million women will never get together. And sisters said, oh yeah, I got something for you. So not only did women march, but they took that energy back to their homes, to their communities. And now we have folks like Stacey Abrams who's running for office. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's running for office. Thousands of other women across the country are saying, if you won't handle your responsibilities, we will, and we'll make real change happen. That's power. We also remember the science march, don't we? Now, I'm going to tell you all something. I know a whole bunch of scientists, and some of them came out their labs a little shaky-like in the beginning. But they came out. They said, come on, it's OK, come on, come on. And then they began to march. And they began to march against an administration that says that science isn't real because they're trying to weaken policy. And they know if they can weaken policy, then they can affect what's happening in our communities and continue to create chaos. So they marched and they took the energy back to communities and said if the federal government will not do what it's supposed to do and abdicate its responsibilities, we will fill that space. And we will make sure that truth and honesty in science is moving forward. And then we've had Black Lives Matter, where we've had young men and losing their lives to police violence, but people have come together. The Muslim ban, folks came to the airports and stood up and showed their power and how we can push back against injustice. And then we also know recently we had the Youth Climate March. This is zero hour. Young people saying that if you will not do what's right to protect our communities, we will. And build an intergenerational process that protects all people. That is power. And that is tied to our vote. Everyone do me a favor. Take the hand of the person on the left hand of you. Grab the person on the other side's right hand. Yeah, y'all should have washed your hands before you came today. <laughs> At the Hip Hop Caucus, we are all about building bridges. We use our artists and entertainers uh, in authentic collaborative partnerships to make sure that real change is happening, that culture is respected, that we are creating content that helps to motivate and move people. But when you look around this room, what you see is that you have people of all faiths, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, atheist, who are coming together. That scares people. You also find that we have African Americans, we have Latinos, we have indigenous brothers and sisters, white brothers and sisters, Asian brothers and sisters. That is power in that moment. And that is how we make real change happen. Dr. King said that we come to these shores on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Nothing could be more apropos than what we are dealing with at this moment but we understand that there is power that exists inside of our boat. Everyone do me a favor, everyone say power. power. Say power. power. I'm gonna let it get real good to you now. Everybody drop those hands, put your right hand in the air, let it get good like 1968 at the Olympics. We're gonna show folks in the state houses, we're gonna show folks in Washington DC what time it really is. Everybody say power. power. I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali, thank you so much for your time.